I want to go and I want to talk to uh, Timothy Alberino about this. Now, for those of you who have been around, you know Timothy Alberino, but he is an explorer, one who has spent many years in the jungles of South America and elsewhere in search of lost cities, lost civilizations, hidden treasures, legendary creatures. He's a published author. Uh, his book Birthright has uh, I I own Birthright. It's gotten a lot of a lot of people have talked and dissected it all over the internet. Themes from that book are going to be brought up tonight in this conversation, and uh, he's published a, a lot of great work that allows him to talk about esoteric topics, including alternative history, megalithic architecture, giants, mythologies, Bigfoot. We talked about a lot of those things, but cryptids. UFOs, alien abductions, and transhumanism. I think that might be popping up tonight. Welcome back to the show, Timothy Alberino. How you doing? Yo, Frank, nice to see you again. Hey, let me ask you something. Before we go on anywhere else, you're in Montana. How's that smoke for you? Because it's terrible for us. We have no smoke. Wow. Yeah, we're usually the ones who are blanketed in smoke when there's fires in Canada, but it... At the present moment, we have no smoke. I'm hoping the winds do not change for our sake. Yeah, I suppose for your sake, maybe. Well, maybe I think they need to. Yeah, I think we're. I think we're done with it. Um, I think we are. Yesterday was the last of the haze. There's still a little something going on out there, but it wasn't the orange skies that we had on Tuesday and Wednesday. But you know, I was just thinking because all the. I was thinking about where you are and how most of the fires were in Western Canada. I thought you'd be blanketed, but I'm glad that the winds have been favorable. Yeah, we're. In- Clear skies over here. All right. So, listen, are, are you going out on, a, on an adventure, or what is the uh, the deal? I know that you're going away earlier, uh, later on this month. That is going to be uh, a, 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 a public event with people. Is this is this pretty much like a resurrection of the, the Amazon river ride that you were going to do? Uh, the, the, the Amazon boat thing was it was too early with the COVID stuff was still going on. So, Peru had, they had some policies in place uh, vaccine policies and stuff so we had to cancel that um but this is different this is a done deal this is sold out event uh it's a tour in peru uh, that i'm conducting Uh, it's really an expedition in peru um up in cusco up in the andes you know looking at the megaliths uh i'll be in peru next week in the jungle i have property in the jungle in the city of terrapoto in the amazon basin uh, so I'll be hanging out there for a week, and then I'll be going up into the mountains and uh, conducting that event. Now, when you go up there, do you have? Um, are you completely cut off? Do you have I, two-way radios for your staff? I'd have to imagine. But do you have satellite phones? Is there any way reception that is, that is uh, being beamed in there, or or how you mean isolated in the jungle? Yeah, how isolated are you when you go in? No, the city of Terrapoto is a, a pretty modernized city. Uh, I would have called it a town ten years ago. Now it's a city. Um, it's it's modernized. They have internet and everything like that. My my land is not. My land is right up. It's the last piece of property that you can get right up against the national reserve, uh, right up against a serious primary jungle. Hmm. Um, there's nobody there. You have to cross the river four times to get to it. So I don't have any cell phone service or anything out there. Um, but in the in the nearby city, there's. All of those, uh, all of the uh, communication services are available. Well, that, that sounds like it's going to be a fun time. Um, I'd love to talk about a little bit more about that later on if we have any time. But, you know, when it comes to the, the topic for tonight, um, UFO reverse engineering disclosure is going on right now. And this is not the Nimitz being allowed to report on uh, that they're being they're often being swarmed by craft that they cannot identify timothy this is the a bob lazar level revelation about origin of things you know so we're 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 talking about the intelligence behind the tech now obviously it's all pentagon approved there's that because i mean it's been delivered by a man who admits he's not a primary source of information on on a hated mainstream media circuit that used to mock people for looking into stuff like this during a mm-hmm. time of deep geopolitical tension i mean it's it's tripped a lot of people's bullshit detectors but you know we've always been a fan of uh fake alien invasion talk so w- this could be the last card how are you seeing it okay well i like to just focus on and analyze what this gentleman actually said what david grush actually said that's what's important to me 
whether or not it's a psyop or whatever, I don't care. I'm only concerned with what he said and if it is verifiably true. And when I say verifiably true, I'm not talking about show me the documents, show me the craft, show me the bodies. You're never going to see any of that. Why? Because it's classified. They're not going to show you classified uh, documents. That's like saying, show me the documents on our on our the new s- stealth fighters that we're developing right now. They're never going to show it to you. It's a national security issue. It's just not going to happen. So when I say verifiable, what I mean is, does it conform to the decades of excellent, competent ufology, UFO research? Does it conform to what we as ufologists know to be true? And the answer is absolutely 100% yes, resounding yes. There's nothing that that man said, nothing, that draws a red flag for me in terms of is he trying to mislead the public? Is he? Is it a bait and switch? Is it a distraction? No, it's the truth. Now, what are his motives? What are the motives of the people perhaps who signed off on this? I don't know and I don't even care. All I care about is the allegation, is the the veracity of the allegation and I, and from my position as a UFO researcher the it's true what he said is true and 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 I I'm speaking in unison with the majority of 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 whom I would consider to be competent ufologists um uh yes the United States government has been recovering crashed UFOs and reverse engineering them to some extent they haven't been very successful in the reverse engineering because we're talking about exotic components. We can we can return to that point in a little while. And yes, we've recovered bodies. And this didn't happen yesterday. We've been doing this since at least 1947, the Roswell event, but even before that, really. Um, and so not, none of this is new to a ufologist. None of this is new to anybody who's been tracking with the uh, UFO research. Um, If this guy would have come out and said something off the wall, something bizarre that doesn't conform with the data, uh, again, the body of data compiled by confident ufologists over the decades, then I would be concerned. Then I would be talking about uh, why are they telling telling us things that are obviously not true. Um, But that's not the case. So motives. Why are they allowing him to say this? I have some thoughts on that, but but I, I don't I don't know what his motives are. I you know if we take him at face value, he was frustrated because he was working in the Aero Project. You know, obviously this guy comes from the intelligence community. He was uh, uh, he was an agent at, at the National National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and the National Reconnaissance Office, and of course he worked on in Aero, and it was his work with the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, Aero. The Pentagon's official UAP uh, investigative body that he began to encounter this secret program, or at least whispers of this secret program. In fact, more than whispers, because Arrow's existence um, is premised on the the notion that there are unidentified anomalous phenomena out there, and this body is supposed to this investigative body is supposed to find out what they are and so he started to pull this thread in regard to if these things are flying around and and we know that we know that they're real so the next obvious question is what have they crashed and have we recovered them do we have any hardware and as soon as he, as soon as he started to pull on that thread he got in trouble well first of all um, according to his testimony, other intelligence officials uh, came to him in private to confirm it, that that is in, in, indeed the truth, and have come forward, by the way, to Congress and to the journalist, uh, the journalists Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal, who broke the story. By the, wall, by the way, those are the journalists who really kicked off this whole thing back in 2017. So this is a continuation of, the, of their reporting, really. It's really a, a major escalation in their reporting. And so he hit this wall because their task, you have to understand, they pulled him over from the intelligence community, investigate UA- UAPs, right? And and he's going at it, and he's following this thread, and he hits a, he hits a wall. And not only does he hit a wall, but he gets, starts getting threatened from private um, contractors 
which makes perfect sense to me. That's exactly who you would encounter when you hit this wall. And uh, and so it all, the story seems very plausible to me. Everything I know about uh, ufology and 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 everything that uh, I know to be true, um, it conforms. His story conforms, and so he wasn't he wasn't read in. He wasn't allowed to be read into this program because it is uh, it's it's got majestic clearance. You can't. They're not going to read. That's just a big Some guy working that, at the Pentagon and do a program and, and 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 bring him into the underground base to see all the crap that they've been trying to reverse engineer and then open up the freezers and show him the bodies. It's not going to happen. Still, it's a big ballsy move for somebody to who just feels burned by work to go out to the media, something like this. He just seems way too comfortable doing it. Not burned by work. His life is being threatened by private contractors. Private contractors. So if you... It, let's use Area 51 because everybody, everybody knows about Area 51. I don't think there's anything at Area 51 anymore. I'm sure they moved the operation after Bob Lazar's whistleblowing uh, incident back in the 90s. But if you were to try and approach the Area 51 military installation, who would meet you? Who would you be confronted by? You'd be confronted by guys and probably wearing all black or some kind of camo and they would be heavily armed. Who would who would these individuals be? Would this be the U.S. military? Would this be the National Guard? No. These are private contractors. That's who you would be confronted with. And these private contractors, uh, they're not doing this job because they're patriotic. They're doing this job because they're a certain kind of personality profile and they're getting paid really well. And 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 that personality profile is often very aggressive and so these individuals are famously i should rather i should say infamously very aggressive very aggressive individuals and so it's not hard for me to imagine that when he started knocking on this door wanting to be read into this program these guys are threatening his life hmm. and perhaps threatening his family um and so in this environment, he has two options now. He can he can shut up and go away and go focus on something else within the Aero program. Hey, let's go look at this incident where there was a light in the sky, which which would seem at, at, at this point ridiculous to him because now he's got information about reverse engineering craft. That's obviously much more important. Or he can do something that was never available before to a whistleblower, ever, ever. And that is to a... To a um, a rather let me say was never a available before to a ufo whistleblower he can go to congress who's already has a body in congress a committee investigating ufos demanding information from the government he can go there that never existed before that is new that's only a, a year or two old and he now he has cover from the media who now accepts the reality of ufos this is a different environment now this is a completely different playing field so these conditions didn't exist before this individual five years ago would have had nowhere to go he couldn't go to the media and he couldn't go to congress because congress and the media would have just laughed him out the door but that has changed and so that's why we now have a whistleblower and why we didn't before i'm not saying this to try and validate to you this individual or his background or whatever no that's i'm not saying that all i can tell you is that what he's saying is true and the conditions have changed for disclosure now we are living in an environment where this kind of disclosure can indeed occur and if you're being threatened if your life's being threatened, if you feel that you have a legitimate reason to be concerned, and this isn't just some Joe Schmo, this is an intelligence guy, okay? So, and he has connections, I'm sure, all over the government and probably in Congress as well. So he goes to Congress. He goes to the, to the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. He asks if he can get these documents. Now, that's interesting that they allowed him to, but who knows? Maybe this is his pal. I don't know. Um, and by the way, before I... Uh, Take a breath here and 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 shut up for a while. <laughs> no, you're um, doing great. Um, we we have to we have to understand that uh, 
I'm going to take a breath and shut up right now because I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> it's all right, man. You know, it's all that. It's it'll all come, that, It'll come back to me. I'm it's sure. all the Canadian smoke. You know, you're doing you're doing it's great. It's the there. Canadian. Yeah, that's right. I have so many things. Just from what you said, there's so many things that pop up for me. Number one, I, I, a stupid little aside thing because I want to get into what you said about him. Really, just speaking truth, we can talk about the messenger and why it's coming now. Uh, but then again, why it's coming now could just be explained as easily as, like you, like you just said, there are avenues for people with legitimate things that they want to say that are available to them that never was, and maybe they're taking advantage of it. Some people could say that the creation of that whistleblower system was a venue for these kind of these scams to be hyped up and given legitimacy so you can lead public opinion in one way or another. Let's also keep in mind i always tell people this beware of the whole media that once the media the media knows all that engages in every day is psychological subversion they understand how people work especially in groups and how they perceive information and trigger words and all that stuff they know what the trends are they know how we're feeling how we're acting toward each other what kind of temperament we're in once they know that the majority of people don't believe them on most issues that in itself becomes a deception opportunity for the media you know or perhaps they're looking for redemption yeah to try and get their ratings back that could yeah redemption or or they just keep going with whatever the hell they they intended to do um so it's true 100 percent on a and 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 i'm I'm sorry to cut you off but i just remember what i was going to say and i don't want to forget it um uh what i was going to say was we have to keep in mind too, and I'll make this very quick. There's there's dueling narratives here. There, this is factional. Something's going on inside of the deep state, what I call the dumb state, the deep underground military bases, because that's where this stuff is housed, right? That's that's where the 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 UFO, the real programs are are underway, is in these deep underground military bases, special access programs, black budget programs. Uh, the president of the United States does not have clearance to access them. Um, so there are dueling narratives. There are it's factional. There are some factions that absolutely do not want anything whatsoever disclosed, whatsoever. Okay, and and there's nothing they can do about it because it because of the everybody's got a cell phone now and obviously, but but they would prefer that nobody knows anything. They want to continue to operate in complete secrecy. Um, these are government agencies and these are military contractors, aerospace contractors, security firm contractors. Then then you have on the other side, you have elements of the government. And when I say the government, we're talking very broadly here, but primarily the Pentagon, who probably know they want to start having this discussion about UAPs. Why? Because the phenomenon is burgeoning. OK, there's no way around it. You got to discuss it. And they want it. They want to come clean with some of this to the American populace, and maybe they don't even know the extent of what's going on, like the reverse engineered craft and all that. They, they, maybe they don't know, but they do know that w- the government knows a lot more than it's saying. And so they're pushing within the government, within the Pentagon. They're pushing within Congress for there to be more disclosure. And then you got the Pentagon who's sitting in between, the official narrative. The Pentagon and NASA and the intelligence community, what are they doing? They are desperately trying to control the narrative. That's what they're doing. They're trying to control this narrative. And that is crystal clear. Uh, keep in mind that what happened a week ago, what happened right before, you know, basically a week before this this bombshell whistleblower testimony. Do you remember? NASA comes out. NASA had an advisory board. Uh, they, I think about a year ago, they tasked an advisory board to study UAPs, UFOs, you know, because the American populace, when you think about aliens and, and testimony about aliens, most Americans are going to think NASA. Well, well, what is NASA saying? They're the ones out in space, right? So what does NASA do? They come out and they give like a preliminary, they, they do a hearing on their findings thus far. And what's the first thing that they say? Dan Evans, who's the the the, the study director um, at this recent hearing a week ago, what does he say? Listen to what he says, okay? Because I'm trying to show you how there's dueling narratives going on. This is very important. He comes out and he says this. I want to emphasize this loud and proud that there is absolutely no convincing evidence for extraterrestrial life associated with UAPs. So there's your official narrative, okay? And then on the other side of this whistleblower, you had the Pentagon that came out and basically said that, uh, um, I'm trying to find the exact uh, 
uh, quote here from the Pentagon. Basically, the Pentagon said, no, we don't. This is what they said. I found the quote. To date, Arrow has not discovered any verifiable information to substantiate claims that any programs regarding the possession or reverse engineering of extraterrestrial materials have existed in the past or exist currently. There's the government narrative. That's what the Pentagon wants you to think. Combine that NASA statement with that Pentagon statement. There's your narrative. That is the official narrative. The whistleblower, that's a different factional issue. And then the guys who want complete, absolute secrecy, that's, a, that's the other side of this situation. So I want everyone to understand there are dueling narratives going on here. There is a, there's like a, um, a cold war going on behind the scenes as it regards to the disclosure of what the government knows about UFOs. This is, okay. I'm I'm glad it took this direction that the uh, the conversation about narrative control because this is the thing that I really can't figure out for myself or even form a, a theory that appeases me in any way shape or form. When we talk about there's conflicting narratives within certain bureaucracies on this one thing, or there's conflicting you know there's a narrative being uh, built up on the media about any any one thing. I mean, the, the, we always forget what they're building the narrative about are intelligent, supposedly vastly intelligent life forms that are, are in possess of knowledge and technology that allows them to traverse time and space. So I, I, I would, when I think about lowly earthly media organizations and even uh, governments being able to put forth a narrative that controls our ability to perceive that kind of an intelligence presence, that's laughable to me. It, it tells me that the aliens, if they exist, they don't want to be seen or they don't exist because how the hell can the New York Times and the Pentagon put up a firewall between us being able to make contact with a uh, an intelligence that's floating around out there and apparently but has some interest in us. Like, what is the real firewall there? I, I I don't I don't understand that how narratives could even be controlled. They like can't. The, oh, that's why. They, this is what I always say: the Pentagon cannot control the phenomenon. All they can do is control the narrative. So, um, sorry, my son just walked in the room here as we're talking. It's all right. Um, so, um, the Pentagon cannot control the phenomenon. They can only control the narrative. They know they can't control the phenomenon. Everybody's got a cell phone. I mean, it, where I'm going in the, in, the, in the jungle, my neighbors in that property I was telling you about, they, they got a cell phone out there. But, I mean, but, everybody's got a cell phone. But now. that's the thing. You, you can't stop people from taking pictures and video. They're going to lose control at some point. They know it. The phenomenon is burgeoning. And so they're trying to stay in front of the narrative and control it. But when you go outside with your cell phone and you take a picture of a UFO, it's not a, it's, you know, like what I was saying, it's not like catching dragonflies. It's not this this bug that has very limited base programming and instinct. We're talking about a, a, a unified, identified, uh, unidentified object up there. That if it's being flown and operated by an extraterrestrial I I intelligence, then it's not just oh, I'm taking part. I'm looking at this this craft in the air, and it's just moving around. There's something inside of there. Why is there no revelation from them? I mean, they don't need, I mean, there's no way that a, that's what I mean by, a, there's no way that an earthly media outlet could ever really keep us from uh, a confirmation if they don't actually want to be seen by a massive amount of people. Simple answer is they don't, they're not talking to us. They're doing something else. Mm. Um, and I think that you would find the answer, the, the, the more profound answers, I think, are to be found within the abduction material, the alien abduction material. And it's, it's interesting because... Here we are. We're talking about, and I'll quote David Grush, we're talking about retrieving a program that was retrieving and is non-human origin. This is, these are his words, non-human origin technical vehicles. Call it spacecraft, if you, if you will, non-human exotic origin vehicles that have either landed or crashed. Does that sound familiar to you? Do you remember back in 2017... Uh, when da Eric Davis, the astrophysicist who is a was at least at the time a consultant to the Pentagon in regard to UFOs, remember this? Eric Davis said, "quote uh, that they had quote off that he had 
rather, that he had handled and examined, quote, off-world vehicles not made on this earth. And uh, he was Pentagon consultant and uh, and, and is an astrophysicist uh, working uh, at um, Baylor University, I believe. I believe it's Baylor. I'm not 100% sure. So uh, this is this is, I think, the real story when you cut through all the UAP bullcrap because they as I think I've, we've talked about this before they they intentionally changed the nomenclature they did that intentionally and that sort of reveals their hand and how they want to control this narrative they don't want us to think about crash retrievals they don't want us to think about nuts and bolts technology they don't want us to think about uh, alien abductions and cattle mutilations they want us to think about lights in the sky anomalous phenomena that we don't know what it is that's what they want us to think about okay they want us to think that they're just now taking an interest in this they do not want us to realize what grush is saying they do not want us to realize that they have known about this not only do they have knowledge of what's going on they've got the, they, they can touch the craft right now they've got the technology they've got the bodies and so um, this is, as I said, this is just as, as um, fantastical as it sounds. It, it, it conforms to what ufologists have known for decades. So then let's talk about another part of what he had said. He was saying that not only that we were collecting craft, but that we have been, and he was asked about how many different species. He said, oh, many. He said many species, many, many artifacts from species. First of all, I keep wondering myself, how the, why the hell can all, species, one species, uh, species or 10, how the hell can they travel all this way from one, a dimension over or two or whatever? Why is everybody, cra why so many crashes? I don't understand the crashing. I don't understand that um, at all. First of all, let's understand that there's probably way more way more activity than we can see because these ships are cloaked and you know i don't i hate to use star trek terminology but they're cloaked they're you can't see them most of the time you can't see these craft we know this from bob lazar bob lazar talked about he he got to see this the the particular craft the sports model that he worked on as he as he refers to it the sports model the one that was in working condition that he was trying to figure out the how the reactor worked on it it was a matter antimatter reactor that used element 115 um he got to see it in operation at least on one occasion and on this particular occasion he noticed that the craft it, it came off the ground and it hovered a little bit and then when it when it was fully energized or more energized it became almost completely invisible at least from certain vantage points why because the craft is distorting the space-time continuum around it so it's bending light it's using gravity waves so we know that gravity bends light so if the craft is producing a gravity wave it's going to bend the light around it and therefore render it invisible so that's why you would see these craft blinking in and out of existence or you know visible and then invisible because it's it depends on how the craft is operating according to lazar who i absolutely believe so and i think this by the way is a conf as you said in the beginning you rightly you rightly frame this as a lazar level declaration event in 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 terms of this whistleblower so um we have to understand that there's probably way more of these things out there than 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 we see. So imagine all the craft that people are now are now glimpsing and taking pictures of. Because there's a lot, by the way. There's a lot. Um, there are a lot of UFO sightings now, and there are pictures. Everybody's getting pictures of UFOs on their cell phones. Lot, not everybody, but you know what I mean. Uh, a lot more people than use than 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 before than years past. I myself had a close encounter with one of these craft. I mean, um, and those are the ones that we see. But what about all the ones that we can't see? And here's, so crashing, the craft is crashing. Fine, crashing, advanced technology, they come to Earth, they crash. How is that possible? I, well, first of all, they're not they're they're not infallible. These are just nuts and bolts hardware. I don't care how advanced it is. Um, it's there's going to be situations in which it malfunctions, right? That's number one. Number two, what if they're shooting each other down? Mm. I mean, what if there's what if there's warfare happening and we don't see it? What if that thing that and I don't know if this story is true or not. I, I don't know. But, you know, the thing that happened in Vegas and it looks like a, a flare or a meteor, or perhaps a, some kind of a craft. 
What if that thing got shot down by a different UFO? Um, it, it's it, there's there there's a there's a handful of different reasons why these crash these craft would crash. Now that's not to say that they're crashing all the time. That's obvious. I've never seen one crash. You've never seen one crash. Nobody you know or nobody I know has ever seen a UFO come out of the sky and crash. Definitely not so in not a city. They're not crashing all the time. Definitely not in a city either. You know, they, they, it would be something else if they, they could finally have one of those crashes right over Times Square. Then you're talking about thousands of people who are suddenly just in the presence of an alien craft. That would be yeah, right. But there's there's things that could be said about that as well. However, so think about. Let's say that the government has, I think a, some some story broke today that the Biden administration know, has like 14 of these things or something that they know about. Okay, let's double it. Let's say there's 30. Let's say we got 30 of these things. You are talking about since what, nine, the 1920s, the 1930s? So we get one a decade or something less than one a decade? That's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about craft just randomly falling out of the sky left and right. Mm. We're talking about rare occasions, very rare occasions. These are special incidences, special events in which something happens and these craft for, for one reason or another come down. And it could be there could be a hundred explanations for we don't know what kind of technology exactly they're using. We know some of them are probably using matter-antimatter reactors and producing gravity waves. Is there something that interferes with that te technology? Is there some sort of an atmospheric thing on Earth that was not the case where these things were fabricated and they're running into issues? Are they shooting each other down? Are there prosaic reasons why these things might crash that maybe the entities died? I don't know. Um, probably some of these things are being piloted autonomously. They're drones. Um, Others maybe are just being piloted by artificial intelligence, which would be the drones. But I also, but I also am referencing biological cybernetic beings that are not fully biological and that are not fully cybernetic, but are are not fully artificial intelligence or hardware, but are a combination of biological and synthetic components. Um, so there's a myriad of reasons why these things might crash. But pe but I think there's this false notion out there that these things are just crashing left and right. Mm -hmm. um, that's obviously not true. Again, we're talking about, even if there's 30 of them that we have, we're talking about since the 1920s. We're what? talking about at least since the 1930s. At least since the 1930s. I think we've been aware of these vehicles and recovering them. Um, and perhaps, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's even way before that, but, well, it, but definitely it, where, where, the 1930s. Wherever it is, if you're able to put a line in the sand where you say, this is when the phenomenon, so we start collecting them, we start having really um, uh, unprecedented interactions with them, seeing them all over the place, I'd love to know what that, that beckoning call, where, where the real interest in the planet uh really really began um well okay so you you mentioned multiple factions i don't know how many factions are out there i, I suspect there's at least a few disparate factions um the ones that ufologists have been talking about most vociferously for decades are you have you have the nordics that look like us um you have the tall whites that look like maybe like those cloning that cloning race from the Star Wars mm -hmm. uh, prequels. Um, they call those the tall whites. Then you have the greys, which are the little gray alien, the classic alien being, and the insect, uh, the insectolins that govern, that are the administ administrators of the abduction program. So those are three factions right there. And then you have reptilians. So those are four potential factions, and there may be more, or maybe there's a, those are blended together somehow, or maybe maybe a couple of those aren't real i'm absolutely 100 percent convinced the grays are real and the nordics those two 100 percent for sure um How? really all four of those groups i think are 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 real factions and as crazy as that that sounds maybe in three four five years from now i'm this isn't gonna sound crazy at all i mean retrieving crashed ufos you know and bodies that sounded crazy to most people uh, a week ago, now I think not so much anymore. So you have at least those factions which are likely in play on some level.
on some level. Well, what's your what, um, what's your go-to evidence for? Like you say, Nor- you're hundred percent convinced Nordic and Greys. I've I've heard about them, the Blue Avians. I've 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 loved going into all this stuff and reading people's uh, you know breakdowns of of where they've been uh, noted. Is there any is there any go-to evidence that you when you say, well, there's there's no evidence for this. I can't I can't believe it and whatever. Where is there a where is there a you know a tens tens of millions of human beings are encountering these things routinely and have been for decades it's called the abduction phenomenon and 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 they uh and as we've and as i've talked about i think at length on your show before this in this when i talk uh, talk about abduction phenomenon and abduction research material we're talking about scientific data that has been collected by competent researchers over the decades that that is corroborated all over the earth it is absolutely undeniable when you take a deep dive into the abduction phenomenon don't look at the stuff on the internet now it's tainted it's new agey it's weird i'm talking about go back to the old school guys go back to uh john mack go back to bud hopkins go back to carla turner go back to uh David Jacobs, these kind of people who are credentialed, who are serious individuals, um, and who did extremely uh, good investigative research uh, on the topic, and have and have compiled a body of data that, in my in my opinion, is unimpeachable, conclusive, one hundred percent conclusive, that the abduction phenomenon is real. People are encountering these entities. They're always encountering the same suite of entities most of the time from all over the world, same kind of circumstances, corroborating from every walk of life, every culture. It, it's it's just undeniable. Hmm. It's absolutely undeniable. Oh, and, I, and then, of course, yeah. as I think I've said on your program before, when you look at this body of evidence, the, the abduction material, alien abduction material, um, you have every kind of of evidence that you would present in a court of law to prove a case and you would prove that case conclusively you have physical evidence you have you have eyewitness testimony you have chemical analysis and residue left by the creatures you have you have in some cases um uh you have individuals who are gone and being searched for from the police in the neighborhood are out looking for them when they're during this time that they're abducted you have community abductions you have mass abductions where where uh, dozens of people are taken at the same time you have instances in which people who have no i have never met each other ever there in their entire life suddenly recognize each other in a grocery store why because they they met each other on the craft they were abducted at the same time you have just and it goes on and on and on the missing the, the missing the pregnancies crime. the missing pregnancies are the things the, that really exactly thank you for saying that that's one of the big biggest one is the is the the um I'm trying to think of the, the the technical term, the missing fetal phenomenon, whatever it's called. That yes, women are impregnated, uh, impregnated with a hybrid uh, zygote, and and uh, it's placed into their uterus, and it, and it grows into a fetus, and 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 by three months thereabouts, before they really start to show, they're reabducted, and the and the fetus is extracted. And many of these women have gone to their, I always screw up this acronym, OBGYN, and and have it confirmed they think they're having a baby and and the, and they're they're excited about it and then in a couple months it's gone no miscarriage no nothing it's just gone and it's documented and some of these women are virgins so um i mean and that's all that's what i'm talking about i'm not talking about i watched a video on youtube i'm not talking about i read a book I'm talking about a compendium of knowledge that has been compiled over decades by competent researchers with every kind of evidence that you could possibly want as it pertains to the veracity of the abduction phenomenon. And um, believe me, the government does not want to open that Pandora's box. They do not want that Pandora's box opened, rather. They do not want us to look into the abduction stuff or to even be talking about abductions. They want us to talk about UAPs, unidentified uh, anomalous phenomena. That's where they want the conversation to be. They do not want to talk about reverse engineered craft and bodies. Hmm. So at least 
the official the official narrative doesn't want to go there. David Jacobs was a was a, a big eye opener for me, and uh, I've heard a, quite a few of his interviews. I have not read any of his books yet, but I always thought it was that was just absolutely fascinating stuff. But when you talk about multiple species, this brings up another thing I, I wanted to bring up. To, and it, uh, I think we're going to start getting down into the uh, the ancient details of all this now, and it ins- it it inspired some more of the same debates around the internet of course when they hear this it's mostly do you think that it's a media larp or not and then when you get beyond that you actually start talking about the idea of extraterrestrial intelligence in in general it always inspires the same stuff and it's it's a lot of different stances people take about whether or not um god's universe is filled with various species of intelligent life and um, I know religious people who are offended at the thought that, in, uh, that intelligent, non-human, organic creatures could exist. I know religious people who are totally excited by the idea because whatever is out there would be part of God's creation as well. And then oh, Leo Zagami was on last night. He says he sends his regards, by the way. And he explained uh, his use. Love Leo Zagami. Yeah. Well, he, he, last night he was talking a little bit about this, too, and he was explaining his use of the term demonic aliens. So... There's the fallen angels who pose as well, aliens group. What? Uh, well, I, Leo I and I would would probably agree. Uh, in, I would agree with the connotation of the word demonic for sure. Um, we might disagree when it when it comes down to the definition of what a demon is, because that's and it depends on what your context is. Um, and and by the way, any any Christian, any any anyone who subscribes to the biblical text who is offended by the notion of extraterrestrial life is not thinking logically about the text. Is, they're just not thinking logically. They're not thinking rationally about the text, about the biblical text. Because as I've said on your program before, the biblical narrative presumes the existence of extraterrestrial beings. Full stop presumes the existence outside and, of uh, outside of demons and, and angels though like are they're talking about like almost like reptilian well, forget about those terms throw those terms out the window they're they're meaningless right now i'm talking about sentient non-human entities whose provenance is not planet earth the, the biblical narrative presumes that reality right out of the gates um and there's you know that's a whole long conversation but but it's absolutely presumed now people can quibble over uh are we talking about interdimensional beings are we talking about extraterrestrial beings what exactly are we talking about it doesn't matter what i just said is 100 percent factual in regard to the biblical narrative we are talking about sentient extraterrestrial enti- entities whose provenance is not planet earth i don't care where it is i don't care if it's narnia but but, it's not the earth but timothy when you think about one of the the insectoids that you're talking about there let's let's think about like an arachnid species or something and then there's a reptilian then there's the tall whites then there's the nordics thinking about those uh, uh, compared to i what exact i know what you're talking about when you say extraterrestrial not of this earth and in that under that that umbrella would be things like demons and uh angels demons. demons are terrestrial they're terrestrial angels, angels. angels okay certainly. so then there's a, for a lot of people when you think of an angel from the bible they would not think that a, a reptilian a flesh and blood in whatever sense that of the word uh, creature that does not originate from this planet would put be put in that same that same spot i think that we're, we're more so talking about a uh, you know, these these creatures not so much biblical i don't know powers and giants you know, of that of that ilk i don't know i don't know how to to really explain it There's- well what you have what what you have i think clearly what you have is you have non-human biological entities you have non-human biological ent- entities okay the fact that they're non-human makes them alien by the way um these are sentient beings so are we to presume that they all come from the earth or from an interdimensional world, the multiverse or something, because that's, this is the, it, see this whole multiverse thing, this whole interdimensional thing, I subscribe to the hyperspace theory of the universe. 
Uh, I believe that there are facets of the universe in which we inhabit, this universe, that are imperceivable. These are dimensional layers of reality that we cannot perceive. But these are hyperspatial realities. In other words, they're not a separate universe. It's not a different uh, dimensional world. Rather, it's dimensional facets of the universe that we presently inhabit but that we cannot perceive. That is what I subscribe to. to. So if someone says to me, do you believe in a m more dimensions than the, th the, than the three spatial dimensions and the one of time? My answer is yes, I do. In fact, I would, I tentatively subscribe, tentatively subscribe to string theory, but I do not subscribe to the multiverse theory that's attached to string theory. It's not, it's not, uh, necessary in regard to the theory itself, string theory. It's sort of an, ad an addendum to string theory. I'm talking about mu the multiverse theory. The multiverse theory, as I'm sure your listeners know, because it's in the Mar it, this is what's in the Marvel universe. This is what's, and a lot of these concepts are just sort of blended together. And so there's a lot of confusion. But the multiverse theory is that there are multiple universes all around us and being created all the time, and that these universes can sometimes interact, and and they're just there's maybe millions and billions of these alternate universes all around us. Um, that's, that is, I don't subscribe to that, but I do subscribe, as I said, to more dimensional facets of our universe that we can't perceive. Okay, so I do subscribe to that. And, and, and let me because I always like to ask this question to people who are contemplating multi, uh, multiple dimensions, interdimensional beings. We don't know what another dimension looks like. The, the, and, and when we talk about more dimensions, if we talk about higher dimensions, because there's so many different ways to talk about dimensions. If we talk about higher dimensions, higher spatial dimensions, we are now in a realm of thought in which our brains, our three-dimensional brains, cannot, do not have the ability to conceive of more than three spatial dimensions in one of time. It's impossible. You cannot, you cannot envision in your mind a hypercube. You can't do it. That would be a, a four-dimensional cube. You can't do it. I can't do it. Nobody can do it. We don't know what they look like because our brains cannot even envision them. Our brains only can, can compute the three-dimensional world. That's how we're created. That's what we inhabit. And so when we talk about dimensions and dimensional realities, when, when, you have to sort of parse what, what's going on here. What, what are people actually talking about? Are we talking about higher dimensions, higher than the three spatial and one of time? So that would be like beings that live in a, a fourth dimension, let's say, uh, that, ha that are completely foreign to us. We can't see them, but they're here. There's a fourth dimension. That's one concept. And that may be very real. Or are we talking about a dimension that is a dimensional world in and of itself? And I always say this because it's the best example. We're talking about Narnia. We're talking about you walk through your closet, you walk through your wardrobe, and you are in a new world that is totally disconnected from the Earth. But it's not part of our known universe. It's a different universe altogether. That would be a dimensional world. But then we also have uh, the multiverse which is a little bit different than that. The multiverse is a different, even, I think, crazy concept. It's, I think it's ridiculous. And then so set those aside, set all that aside, because, yes, theoretically, all, the, all of those are possibilities, of course. But then we have this one other possibility that's sitting on the table, and it is the most, I think, the most rational possibility, the most obvious one. It's the Occam's razor of this whole situation, we have other planets in our universe. We live on a planet. That's where we come from. When we look at a telescope, and if I look at through a good telescope, I can see the contours of Mars. I can see on Jupiter. I can see I can see the rings of Saturn. I did the other day through I have access to a high powered telescope sometimes. It's absolutely fascinating. So I don't understand like the knee jerk reaction to say, no, 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 it can't be those, the ones that I can actually see through the freaking telescope. I, I'm living on one of those things. It, it can't be that. No, no, it can't be that. That's too crazy for some reason. Instead, 
it's interdimensional or it's from a multiverse or something. And I don't even know what that is. None of us have ever seen it. There is no proof whatsoever, absolutely zero, that there is another dimension, let alone th that there's an ability to go between them. There's no proof of that whatsoever. And I'm not saying that you can't. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the simplest answer is the one we can see with our eyes through a telescope. And if these beings are in possession of advanced aerospace vehicles, which they are, um, that can, can traverse through water and the through the uh, water in the very same way it traverses through the air. In other words, it makes no splash. Why? Because it's not moving through the medium of water. It's not moving through the medium of the air. It's creating a gravity bubble. The space time is moving around the craft. It's not moving through space. Space is moving around the craft. So if it can move like that, then why can't it go into outer space? Oh, I, I, why can't it, why can't it go to the moon? Why can't it go to Mars? It can. Yeah, well, the, so, well it, it's, you know, when it comes to, I apologize for the rant, uh, Frank. I just worked up over all this over the last few days. No, no. I, I, what I wanted to try to, 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 to refocus you on, though, really, was it was just about, I mean, as far as where they come from or what the real pancake makeup of conscious the conscious universe is, whether it be multiverse, string, whether it, there's none of that at all, what I'm saying is, like, right here, right now, um, people have a hard time conceiving of there being a, a chance to be anything else other than us because of one Why? I, I hate it I, I i just told you there's a lot of people have different interpretations uh biblically what's going on there other people believe that we we, we there is the, you know space isn't even real so there can't be anything coming in uh, uh intergalactically uh you I mean there, i'm just saying it, what this has brought up because the whistleblowers talked about multiple species and collecting their technology is this idea of well how can there be multiple species if all aliens are demons or or and vice versa or, or something else and right. i wanted to bring this up in particular one of the first shows you came on with me you did you described the um, the insurrection of in heaven uh, being yes. described as a kinetic war, you know, whose fallout could be seen all over the universe. And that still messes with me because yes. when I think of angels, I don't see them needing craft or laser cannons. That's something I've always, the imagery that we get from alien invasion movies like Independence Day. So, um, so when it comes to craft origin, how do we know if a craft was heaven made or made from just an off world biological intelligence? Well, <clears throat> to begin with, um, I suppose we need to deal with the term demonic very quickly. So demonic would reference anything that's malevolent or nefarious. That's, that's a separate term from demon. The term demon references if you are within the context of the biblical narrative. Okay, so let's get into the context of the biblical narrative and let's deal with the word demon. Because this is the one that's in everybody's head. So a demon within the ancient Hebrew worldview their cosmology a demon is is and only is the disembodied spirit that proceeded from the bodies of dead nephilim in other words dead giants so those giants were unsanctioned creatures they were never supposed to exist they were abominations they were the combination of the watchers these angelic entities and human women they were the result of the procreation the procreative activity between the the watchers and human women now let me stop right there procreative activity what does that tell you if you're thinking logically if you're thinking rationally about this that's telling you that you're dealing with two compatible species right there they hmm. can procreate okay so but these the, so a demon again within the context within the ancient hebrew context is exclusively the disembodied spirit of a Nephilim that perished in the world before the Great Flood. That's what they are. These are the unclean spirits that we encounter in the New Testament. These are the unclean, the, the, the Gadarene demoniac legion, this man who was filled with multiple, probably thousands of demons and legion. A Roman legion was anywhere from three to 6,000 men. So the demon called itself legion because there were so many of them inhabiting this guy. These are disembodied spirits inhabiting this person. Uh, those do not come from anywhere else but planet Earth. And and, and th that is the very uh, narrow hmm. definition of demon according to the Hebrew cosmology, according to Hebrew cosmology. Now, 
the broader definition of, and I don't even know if there is a, a, a Western definition of demon, but the broader a conception, conceptualization of demon in the West, in the Western world, is abstract. It's it's an abstract abstract con, uh, uh, concept. It's not one particular thing. So, in the minds of most Americans, secular or Christian, and in the minds of most Westerners in general, a demon doesn't have a definition it's just that thing that's scary and grotesque and malevolent and evil mm -hmm. that non-human thing that's what demon is it's not a specific thing it's just a non-human evil bad thing uh sec that's how a secular person would think of demon a christian would add and is in a in a and in, in, has a posture of enmity with god right so that would be the addendum from the christian Perspective. So this is a nefarious creature that is that is uh, evil, and its intentions are against God and against mankind. So that's a demon. Well, that's a very, very, very broad term, which means almost nothing. It means almost nothing because it because it can mean almost anything. Therefore, it means almost nothing. So that term, I have no use for it because most people, when they talk about a demon, they're not talking about it within the contextual origin of the term, going all the way back to the, uh, to the ancient Hebrew. Um, we can talk about the Greek, you can, you can research how the, the Greek word uh, daimon and daimonion and all of this is maybe has a little bit of a different connotation, but even in the Greek lore, because that's where the word demon comes from, the, the word demon comes from daimon in the Greek. And that word, you know what that refers to? It refers to the spirits of the heroes who perished where in the world before the flood. That's who the demons. That's who the. So it's like the same terminology. That's the same concept. These are disembodied spirits. Those spirits are earth born. They were born here. They, they proceeded from the bastard sons of the watchers, and they are in a in a they are in a condition that is a curse. According to the Book of Enoch, they're cursed to wander the earth bodiless, hungry, thirsty, having all of the sexual desires and all of the carnal desires, but without flesh with which to fulfill them, through which to fulfill them. And so they're in this miserable, terrible, tormenting condition. It's a curse. And so what do they want? They're seeking bodies to inhabit. And this is how we always encounter them in the, in the, in the New Testament. So that's what a demon is. Now, let's return to this broad nonsensical almost concept of a demon in the western world secular and christian well and keep it keep it keep it um uh, related to the, the the ufo phenomenon in particular well, too yeah okay yeah. that's where i'm going so 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 in in regard to the ufo phenomenon the the hebrew the hebrew concept of the demon the, the hebrew definition of the demon to me doesn't apply that's a that's they're a different thing i don't think they have anything to do with ufos and aliens however if you take the western conceptualization of this term demon then it, i suppose it could apply to anything mm. it could apply to the boogeyman it can it could apply to anything really it could apply to bigfoot it doesn't matter because as long as you perceive it to be malevolent then you can just take that brush demon and paint it over anything. So if you mean by demon, if you mean that these beings are malevolent, then I'm only going to agree with you halfway because I would say some of them are malevolent. And when I say them, I'm talking about these extra, let's, let's even constrain it to the non-human. Not let's not even talk about extraterrestrial. Some of these non-human entities are malevolent. Certainly not all of them. You could never derive that from the biblical narrative because we encounter a lot of good ones. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that the, that the bad ones, the bad non-humans are in the minority. So, so to just call the phenomenon, to just label it with this term demon is so inaccurate. It has no explanatory power whatsoever it does not inform you or me of anything all it tells us is scary gross bad evil that's all it says and that's not even accurate it's not 100 percent accurate it's accurate certainly for some of these things but it's not even accurate for all of them so that's why i don't like that term demon it's 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 infantile uh, to some extent so 
you're you're using the right kind of terminology. You're talking about a factional situation. You're talking about different species. You're talking about a very a variegated assortment of entities. Now we're getting to a more definitive situation, a complexity that we can begin, even if it's just a little bit, we can begin to discern this complexity here. Not all of these entities are evil, and and we cannot know. Uh, which factions, which of these entities come from which factions or anything like that. But we can certainly discern the complexity that's that's here. There's a substrate of complexity. So if we embrace the complexity and instead of our instead of our 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 need to automatically whip out this demon brush and start and start making aggressive motions with it towards this phenomena rather if we step back we embrace the complexity we understand that that there is something going on here that is so detailed that is so complex even if we were to be given a lot of, of the information that the government knows even if we were be, to be given all the information that the government knows we probably would still be scratching our heads well, do you know about the okay? Well, we're talking about demons and aliens now, um, and 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 how to properly apply the terms. And of course, if you can't just describe the things that are floating around in the sky as demons, then um, then of course you have to find something else to describe them as. But do you know non-human entities? <laughs> right, exactly. So, so do you know um, much about the uh, Vril Society? I am. Um somewhat familiar with the real society you, you mean what? as it pertains to the nazis yes so the you, real maidens yeah maria orsic yes um yeah so when it, it makes me think about this stuff here um for example, when I when I've read all the accounts of the German Vril Society uh, receiving telepathic instructions from somewhere in the Taurus constellation about how to create the craft that well, I guess would That's become right. the foundation for the Nazi projects like the Bell. Um, now, was in your opinion, do you think that that was really the uh, all the barons that were that were contacting the Vril, being okay. gener being generous galactic neighbors, or was that a demon encouraging us to build technology well, unseen since the war spoken about in the Bible? You know why the Vril Society exists? What the Vril Society, what the name came from? It came from, oh, geez, I always get this guy's name wrong. I've read the book, uh, Edward Lytton Bull, or Edward Bull Litton, I can't remember. I think it's Edward Lytton Bull, uh, or something like that. You can go and check. Uh, he wrote a book about these entities that dwell under the ground. It was a fiction, but lots of people think he was it was tongue in cheek for for something he knew that the secret societies knew about this race of beings that were inhabiting the interior of the earth that were called the Vril. And they harnessed the power that was called Vril as well. So this the race and the power are called Vril. And so the Vril Society was um uh the Vril Society was organized around this concept of the Vril, both the, the, the power of Vril and the entities, the beings, the Vril. And so m my inclination is that Maria Orsic and the Vril maidens, who had very long hair because they believed it helped them make contact with these entities, were trying to make contact with the Vril, spe specifically with the Vril. And maybe that's what some of those uh, uh, Nazi expeditions were about as well. Uh, but the Nazis believe that they hailed from a master race, obviously a an, a a very ancient god infused race of humanoids. Um, the Vril were something else. The Vril were these entities living under the ground. You maybe can think of them as sort of like a gray alien type thing, or maybe like the tall whites but gray, and they had wings and all this kind of stuff in the in the fictional narrative. Um, so the Vril Society, what I find very, very interesting is exactly what you said. We're talking about what? Telepathic communication. And remember what I told you, I think it was a few times back. I believe that the human species is inherently telepathic. That means that, that we were created with the ability to communicate telepathically, and that telepathic communication is the primary language. Verbal, audible communication uh, verbal communication is the secondary language of the human species, I believe. Um, uh, and so telepathic communication is probably the norm, is probably the norm as it pertains to, it's normative as it pertains to uh, uh, intelligent beings in the cosmos. And so the Vril Maidens were attempting to make contact, just like you said, with somebody, and they did in fact receive a telepathic communication. Now, 
they, according to the, and the, this is the lore regarding the Vril Society. Who knows how much of it is accurate? We know there was a Vril Society. We know the Nazis were steeped in the occult. That's for sure. We know that um, Adolf Hitler was looking for the Spear of Longitis. We know he was looking for the Holy Grail. We know he was looking for these artifacts, which he thought had magical powers. Um, so he had a lot of these occult concepts, and he absolutely believed in them. And more, more than him, the people behind him, the people behind him, uh, were the ones who uh, who believed in it more than him. The the other members of the Nazi Party who were who were really the occultists behind the scenes. Um, so they believed that if they could find these artifacts and make contact with these races, that they could somehow harness the power of Vril, that they could get technology and obviously uh, deploy it in the war. Uh, with their plan to create a new world order. That's what they want to do. They wanted to create a global new world order. That's what Hitler wanted to do. He says it in Mein Kampf. So, um, uh, so they ended up projecting whatever it is that they were doing, the, these real maidens, and according to the lore, they made contact with somebody who knows who it was. But what they received it was exactly what you said, it was schematics. What they received was schematics. They didn't receive like loving messages about peace and unity and taking care, care of the planet or religious uh, messages. No, they received schematics. In fact, the schematics came to them in a couple of different languages. I think if I remember correctly, one of the languages was like ancient Sum Sumerian and the other one was definitely the coded, um, the coded script of the Templar. So the Vril maidens didn't even know what they were writing down. It had to be, it had to be uh, interpreted, uh, translated, and once it once it was translated, it was schematic. Schematics to build allegedly saucers, allegedly to build Der Gleich. Uh, in my opinion, Der Gleich, the bell, probably was using some kind of uh, mercury uh, device that circulates mercury counterclockwise and is the same kind of technology that we read about in the in the mahabharata and in the ramayana the uh the indian epics right so the the vimana craft um that's what the der Gleich seems something to that effect to me um whether or not it was i don't know but obviously the nazis were doing something and, and then from the nazis themselves you had um I'm trying to remember his name. Herman Oberth, I think, was his name. The guy that was above uh, uh, the uh, the guy that we brought over for NASA. I just totally lost his name. Anyway, from the guys that worked on the Nazi rocket program, uh, hinted to the U.S. officials once they came over into our programs, we integrated them into NASA and so forth, that they had help in creating their technology, or they they had help in pursuing a space based platform for rockets or whatever it was that they were trying to do or or at least a rocket that could uh, that could go into low orbit and you know strike new york city that that they were certainly working on that they said they had help and when they say they had help they meant from alien non-human alien entities and actually they they the, the inclination was extraterrestrial entities so that's sort of encapsulating that whole nazi story so having said all that who were the beings that they contacted well, were they just like demonic spirits? Possibly. Were they, were they like gray alien type entities? Possibly. Were they like Nordic type entities? Po I mean, who knows? They're, were they the Vril? Do the Vril exist? Supposedly they they're really called the Aldebarans. The Aldebarans, I think, was the name. Uh, somewhere in the Taurus constellation. That's what I what right. I was remembered. So I right. and I, I started thinking. Well, it, especially since this is telepathic, obviously it, it's uh, you can see a lot of a lot of similarities to the story, to the uh, the Jodie Foster film Contact, where we get the schematics and then we get to go and, and have our our meeting on the beach with uh, Jodie Foster's dad, and um, and and that is a. That's what I was thinking about. This is like, is this actually a a message from on, uh, from you know deep in in the uh, the universe there, or is this one of those situations where it was some kind of uh, demonic possession? Because you were talking about a group that was very heavily steeped in the cult, and, uh, and that's right. And, and that would that's be right. interesting to me because of everything you had brought up in past conversations about yes. how the biblical wars were kinetic. And I was wondering if this was a demon trying to Possibly. encourage the, the Nazis to rebuild unseen technology, seen, the technology not seen since biblical war broke out. That's right. That That's right, and, and let's be more specific, because I, I, I'm absolutely tracking with you. It certainly could have been unclean spirit that they were in contact with, or spirits, or de real demons, right? Real demons. 
Um, and remember, I said that the demons proceeded from the bodies of dead giants in the antediluvian age, in the world before the flood. And so from my point of view, I call that the empire of the gods, the time before the flood, the empire of the gods. I believe that there was advanced technology in that world. We're not even talking about off planet. We're talking about right here on planet Earth. I believe there was advanced technology, that there were giants, that the gods were walking among men. And when I say gods, I mean the watchers, these angelic extraterrestrial entities were walking among men and were teaching, according to the book of Enoch, and were teaching mankind their knowledge and and probably uh, assumedly developing technology from that knowledge or helping them develop technology. So it's very possible that the remember demons are the disembodied spirits of the giants who were the offspring of the watchers and the book of enoch specifically says that the watchers taught their children they taught them the knowledge that they had and so that would be what that would be like physics and math that would be like functional knowledge from which you derive technology so it's very possible that the maria Orsic and the Vril Maidens and the other Nazi occultists were communicating with unclean spirits or familiar spirits that proceeded from the Nephilim who would have had that knowledge. Maybe who would have had that knowledge because they had advanced, they had Vimana craft, for mm -hmm. example. They had stuff like this, and so they were conveying that knowledge through the mediums through the Vril maidens and that's interesting maybe they were conveying that knowledge one of those languages maybe was their native language and they were conveying that knowledge through yeah the Vril maidens and I, we're, we're just you know speculating Spec here yeah. but but i'm tracking with you and i i agree that's a very strong possibility and a very interesting one yeah well i i mean and then there's the, and then there's this one last question i have for you because you know i, I want to i have we have about five more minutes i want to give you the whole five on this because I was listening to Coast to Coast not too long ago, I think back in April, and they had this this uh, this guy on. His name was Scott Mitchell. Do you know of his work? Well, I don't not, believe I do. Anyway, he was talking a lot about discussing some things that I know that you have covered extensively in in Birthright, and what he had said earlier on in the in this episode with George Norrie was that um, only since only a third of the angels that rebelled against God, uh, only a third that they are, like you said, outnumbered two to one, the army of fallen angels is completely, you know, weak in its state. And then he said that Satan is increasing the size of his army through an alien abduction hybridization program. My question to you is, is it actually possible that we're being hybridized for a final battle? And secondly, does that mean that there are literal superhumans walking among us that we just can't see because there's definitely no more 10 foot tall Nephilim giants. So um, not demonically possessed people. I'm talking about demigod like hybrids who are direct progeny of demons that have been hybridized into our to try to level out the playing field for the final battle. Is that possible? Totally plausible from my point of view. Totally plausible. Uh, I think that, that, in fact, that's a scenario that I've contemplated. I think I put a footnote in my book about it. It is a, it is a potential scenario. Um, and uh, I would, I, I, it, it, it definitely resonates with me. I don't know if it's true, hmm. but it definitely resonates with me. And I don't know that individual, uh, but, but I think he, he's, that is a plausible hypothesis. Well, okay. Well, then that, that, and, that. And, but it's just, you know, so people will, they they when i because you know i've i've gone through this whole conversation here with you trying to help you understand my position when as it pertains to this word demon and why i don't like the word demon but because i don't like the word demon to refer to the to the to the ufo phenomenon don't think for one minute that i don't believe in demonic entities mm. i absolutely do and don't think for one minute that i think that all these aliens are just these wonderful peace loving beings absolutely not I think that probably the majority of the ones that we are encountering is, and 100% of the ones that are abducting people are absolutely demonic in the sense that they are nefarious and they are malevolent and they have some sort of an insidious plan as it pertains to planet Earth and its human inhabitants. Well, I guess like most things we are going to have a front row seat maybe not in this lifetime but as cause as, you, as we've done the math before it could be in the next 100 to 200 years that we really start seeing major 
watershed moments in our development or our decline. Um, but it's always great to have you on again, uh, uh, Timothy. I'm, I'm glad that we were able to do this. I'm glad we were able to move it up and get more time together. So uh, enjoy your trip. And if there's anything else you want to leave people with before we go, um, I'll direct them all at timothyalberino.com. Yeah, uh, it's always a pleasure to be on with you, Frank, always. Uh, and uh, people can just look me up on social media, Tim, at Timothy Albrino and uh, YouTube. YouTube, I'm, gonna be, I'm sort of trying to publish more content on YouTube So uh, and my website, obviously. So thanks a lot for having me on. Yes, okay. Be safe in your travels. Thank you, sir. Later.